Hello everybody. Welcome to today's webinar on conventional and spectral flow cytometry panel building and data analysis with FlorafLinder and FCS Express. My name is Sean Burke. I'm the Senior Product Manager at DeNovo Software. I'm joined on the call today by Jeff Jensen from FlorafLinder and the teams from DeNovo Software and FlorafLinder are also on the call to help take some questions. The teams at FlorFinder and DeNovo Software are really excited to be collaborating on this webinar today to give you some more information about how to build panels for both conventional flow cytometry and spectral flow cytometry data um, within FlorFinder, and also to follow up on that and show you how you can use some of the tools in FCS Express to help make analyzing the data that comes from your panels a little bit easier and more efficient in FCS Express software. So with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Jeff Jensen today um, so we can start and tell us a little bit more about FlorFinder and how to work with the conventional and spectral flow cytometry data analysis tools. So hi, Jeff. Welcome to the call. I'm going to make you the presenter here. Sounds good. And let me know if you can see my screen. Looks great. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate uh, you guys co-hosting this webinar with FlorFinder, and thanks everybody for taking the time to join us today. Uh, I think Sean mentioned it a little bit, but uh, the basic rundown is we're going to spend 20 or 25 minutes or so talking about FlorFinder and panel design um, with our platform, and then the panel that we work on here, we'll hand it over to Sean, and they will basically take that same panel and show you how to, do, how to analyze the data from that panel in using the FCS Express uh, software. So, uh, right off the bat, let's mention, I think a lot of people out there probably don't know much about FlorFinder. We are about a six-year-old company. Uh, we were founded by a gentleman named Roland Marcus, who was working out of National Jewish Health and University of Colorado. And the company got started out of a basic frustration with the fact that as, as he was trying to learn how to do flow cytometry, the learning curve was, was rather steep. And there was also frustration that the information he needed to design experiments was spread all over a dozen or more websites and it was just really inefficient to try to to try to bring that all together so the vision was you know wouldn't it be nice if you had something that would allow you to um, stay organized and consistent in your panel design that brought all the information you needed or a lot of the information at least into one location and help you to help you to be able to um, design your panels. The, the, the second thing was also that same spot. What if you had tools or things that could assist you in your fluorochrome selection as you're going through designing your panels, allowing you to make smarter choices on your fluorochromes and make less errors? And then lastly, instead of having, you know, 12 browser tabs open or, or using, you know, Excel spreadsheets or pen and paper or whatever to design your panels, if, if you had a system that brought products from all different suppliers into one place and allowed you to find them easily, that would be a big help. Um, you know, in one part of the world, they may call an, a particular antibody uh, uh, by the name of SLAM, and another place, they may call it CD150. And those are basically the same thing, or they are the same thing, so it would be nice if you could find it easy, or easier. Um, similarly, what if there was a new fluorochrome or a new product that was released by some supplier and you were able to find that right at the time when you're designing your panel without having to do a search on a bunch of different websites to find it? So these are all things that FlorFinder tries to do. That's the main purpose of our website. Um, a little bit about our community. We're up about 30,000 active users now. We're in about 1,000 flow cores around the world, and our platform is 100% free to use for all academic and nonprofit researchers. Um, so you can access FlorFinder anytime you want. If you are with the company, Takeda, Bristol-Myers, Regeneron, Pfizer, AbbVie, Celgene, wherever, um, there are lots of companies that use FlorFinder as well. And for corporate use, there is a subscription required. And you can contact us after the webinar to get pricing information on that. Uh, I'm going to jump out of here and go right to the FlorFinder website. So this is our main website. And I think today we're going to be spending all of our time here on the panel builder. So when I click into the panel builder here, the first thing to do is enter your institution where you're doing your research and your, your flow core facility or your lab. And then we should have your cytometer configurations already entered into our system. That is if somebody has contacted us and sent us the information. So 
you find your cytometer and enter it. If it's not already in there, you can email us at support at floorfinder.com or use this chat feature down here in the bottom right corner and get a hold of us that way and just say, hey, you know, we need to add whatever university you're from to FloorFinder and we can get you set up. So jumping right in, the first thing here is to select an instrument and to click on view configuration. So typically you're not going to use this page too much, um, but I wanted to show it to everyone just so you get uh, familiar with the landscape of what a cytometer looks like in our platform. We have our lasers down the left hand side, our filters and our long pass filters. If there were short pass filters on this configuration, we'd show it. Um, we have colors that are suggested you, actually by the core manager or whoever sets up the machine. You give us a list of colors that you like to use in each channel. And then we, Floor Finder adds to that. We add different equivalent colors to each channel. And as you go through the panel design process, um, we're even going to show you products for additional colors beyond what's shown here. Um, there are four main pages on Floor Finder, a cytometer page, a markers page, products, and summary. And once you get familiar with the machine on Floor Finder, uh, you're generally going to skip the cytometer page and go right to the markers page. Um, so once you confirm that what we have in our system is in fact exactly what you're using in the lab, you'll go onto the markers page, which will look something like this. And just for the sake of time, I went ahead and entered a few of the markers that Sean is going to be analyzing later. So on this page, I've entered CD3, CD16, CD45, CD4. Um, also entering in CD9, 19, CD8. You don't have to um, use just phenotyping markers here as you're, as you're entering things. You can type in, let's say you wanted a specific viability die or something, you could type in 7 to 8D or whatever you wanted. You could type in different categories. Like for example, if you didn't know which viability die you wanted to use, you could type just in the word viability and you can get different categories of fluorochromes, DNA dyes, or double-stranded DNA dyes or mitotrackers or nucleic acids or whatever categories of things you want to look at, so not just phenotyping. Um, but once you've got your markers in, the only thing FloorFinder requires is that you add your marker and your target species. Here in this case, I've selected human. And there are some additional optional filters, and I'm going to go over those before we move on to our products page. So here I'm looking at my CD3 human products, and I'm expanding this to give you an idea. This is some of the colors, some of the fluorochromes that there are CD3 human products conjugated to in FloorFinder's database. And if I continued right now, if I continued onto my products page, I would see every product in FloorFinder's database for CD3 human. But maybe I don't want to see all those. So um, you may have noticed that the list of color names here, and under each one there's a certain number of color bars. Like for APC, for example, has got five color bars. That is, in fact, an indication of relative brightness. So APC is a bright floor versus a Luxfloor 700 here next to it has got one color bar for a relative brightness of one. And where we use that is with these filter options. So let's say instead of seeing, wanting to see all of the products for CD3 human, you just wanted to see for a particular clone. You could use these filters, the clone filter in this case, and maybe I just want to see my hit 3A products. So when I select hit 3A, you're going to see a whole lot of these colors now have been grayed out. So what this is showing you is that when I move on to my next products page now, I'm only going to see the products for these fluorochromes because those are the only ones in our database where there's a product that's conjugated to the, with the hit 3A clone. I'm going to set that back to any. See all the other fluorochromes will pop back up here. Same thing is true with antigen density. So FloraFinder uses an antigen density slider to um, allow you to filter down the products for your search. We made a decision a long time ago not to enter the antigen density or to preset the antigen density for any fluorochrome, or excuse me, for any marker. And the basic reason for that is because we understand that we're never going to know your exact biology better than you do. So sure, normally CD3 is going to be a highly expressed antigen. Uh, but what if you're working with a particular cell type or disease state or drug-induced state where CD3 is not highly expressed? In that case, you may want to set this something different. But let's assume the normal where my CD3 is going to be highly expressed, high antigen expression, where I'm looking for just a dim floor to conjugate to. So when I set this, you'll notice now all of my brightest floors have been dimmed out or grayed out, and only my moderate to dim floors are still showing. So what this means is now if I move forward, 
and continue on to my products page, I'm only going to see the products for these fluorochromes because I set this antigen density bar. Now, I'm going to set it back to all options here. And I do want to say that's a nice way to filter down your product selections or product searches. But we get a phone call or an email pretty much every day from someone around the world saying, hey, I know BioLegend or Novus or somebody has a product for CD3 human conjugated to APC. How come it's not in your database? And the reason is almost always because they used one of these filter boxes to eliminate that choice for themselves. So be aware. It's a powerful feature, but you want to be careful using it. I'm going to check real quick here just to see. Okay. So after you have all your markers entered and you've set the filters however you wanted to set them, or maybe in this case, like I'm not setting any of them, you can go ahead and click the continue button here. And again, for the sake of time, um, I've moved on to another tab where I have the same now. This is my, my products page. And I have my lasers and filters down the left-hand side. But now I can see across the top of the page, I've got the markers that I entered in the last step. And this page is really where you're going to do most of your work on FlorFinder. Here I've already made a selection for CD45 and for CD19. And you can see that those columns have been grayed out. And one of the ways this page becomes so useful um, in FlorFinder is that it sort of becomes your digital worksheet. This is where you can really quickly see like as I scroll down here, this is where I made my per CP sci fi 5 selection for CD45, and you can see that that channel has been grayed out. So if I'm doing a larger panel, and there's lots of selections being made, this makes it very easy to see what channels are still available on your cytometer, and which ones are not. Same thing for my CD19 selection. Here I've selected APC, and that is one of the benefits of FlorFinder in terms of staying organized. With my CD4 selection, let's say I wanted to consider selecting PE Sci7 for that. And right now I'm just talking about conventional cytometry. One of the nice things about FlorFinder is as I'm considering a fluorochrome, if I hover over that fluorochrome, I'm going to get a pop-up like this. And here I can see the excitation and emission for PE Sci7. And I can see that channel, this rectangle here that's representing the channel that I'm looking at PE Sci7 in. And FlorFinder gives you this value called, that we call a percent filter value. So basically telling you how well that filter is going to be capturing emission from this fluorochrome. So here's my PE size 7 column. But if you'll notice, I also have another column here for per CP size 5, 5. And that's because I already selected per CP size 5, 5 in this same experiment. And lo and behold, that fluorochrome affects one of these same channels that PE size 7 is affecting. So these are all of the channels on this cytometer that PE Sci7 is having an impact on. And because per CP Sci55 impacts some of the same channels, we show that to you. So in this case, it's not a big problem. My PE Sci7 is 64%. My per CP Sci55 is 4%. That's going to be not really a big problem. I can easily compensate out for that. But what if there was a situation where this was 64% and the fluorochrome that you're hovering over or looking at or already selected was at 50% or 45%. Whatever the threshold is for your level of, of confidence, um, that's going to impact whether or not you want to choose that fluorochrome. And of course, that'll vary a bit if you've got lots of space left on your cytometer. Maybe you can afford to be picky and, and choose things that have very little overlap. But if you're maxing out all the channels on your cytometer, maybe you, you need to, to use something that has a higher value here. So that's one of the tools in FlorFinder that we think is helpful for using, helping people select their fluorochromes. You may be able to see, I don't know if you can see it on the screen share here, but the PE size 7, right next to it, there's a little 68 that's in parentheses. I've got it highlighted in blue here. That's telling me that there are 68 commercially available fluorochromes conjugated to CD4 PE size 7. And if I click on that, up pops a list of those 68 products. So they're broken down by, by vendor. And these, this, the order of these vendors will be all random. There's Thermo and Tombo and BD. And next time I do a search, these, these vendors will be in a different order. But in keeping with FlorFinder, what we're trying to do here is quickly give you the information you need to select a product. Um, furthermore, if there was a, a new product, let's so say by a vendor that you had never heard of, or maybe it was thermal, but you didn't know they had a product for a particular marker and clone type, it's going to appear on this list right in front of your face, even though you didn't go to their website and search for it. So as I'm searching for all products from all vendors, new products are going to appear right here. I can quickly 
check out the TDS link, the technical data sheet for Thermal, and that'll take me to a new page outside of Floor Finder and bring me right to, to what Thermo has to say about that particular product. And again, that's also in keeping with Floor Finder. We're trying to bring you the information as quickly as we can to help you make better decisions. There are citation images, citations and images here as well. Some manufacturers have um, reviews, product reviews in here. So you get a five-star review system. Um, let's say I wanted to select that product in Floor Finder. I'm going to go ahead and select it. I should mention these prices. These are list prices, so we don't know your discounts, but they're still good for a comparison on relative terms. So when I've selected that, now I've got my CD4 column is grayed out, and the channel where I selected that is also grayed out. And again, it brings me back to my worksheet. I want to show one other thing about Floor Finder and selecting colors and some of the things that we do to try to help. Let's say for CD16, I wanted to select PE, or, or actually, let's do Psi3. So Psi3, I could hover over, and maybe I'm going to select Psi3 in this channel here. And I'll pick my, in this case, it's a BIOS product, so I'm going to pick that. Now, Floor Finder, in addition to graying out the channel where I selected that product, you'll see I got this warning up at the top of the page. And this is telling me that the 561 laser, 582.15 channel, has been blocked by Psi3 color emission. I could leave that blocked, or I can open it. And here's a visual of what I'm talking about. I selected my Psi3 product in this channel. And again, this is for standard cytometry, not spectral, um, or traditional cytometry, I should say. And even though I selected my product in this channel, Floor Finder has blocked out this other channel. And that's because we expect the Psi3 emission into that channel is going to be over a certain threshold, like what I was talking about before. We've got, here we've got two percentages very close to each other, and the emission is going to be so high that you're probably not going to want to use any other fluorochrome based on traditional cytometry in this channel. So we block it out for you. Now, if you know that you're an expert and that's going to be fine and you're going to be able to use it, you can always click this override and open. And when I do that, now that channel will get opened back up. But the specific fluorochrome, in this case, Psi3, is, is not. So I should point out a difference here, since we're trying to talk today about both traditional and spectral cytometry, that for spectral cytometers, Floor Finder does not do this channel blocking. And I can show you that here. So this is a, a configuration of a spectral machine in Floor Finder. And this, in this case, this is a Cytec Aurora. It happens to be a Regeneron one, but it could, be, it could be any. It's just a generic machine here. And what we've done is we've used the short pass and long pass filters to describe what we call virtual channels. So in this instance, I can see here my long pass at 372, my short pass at 386. And then without any gaps in the spectra, in the spectrum here, each channel just covers the entire spectrum all the way down the line. And when I move on to a products page, so here's a products page for a spectral machine. I can see, so this is um, that, same, that same machine, SciTech Aurora, and I've made some selections here. And if I was to look at, sorry for all the scrolling around, but if I was to go back to my 561 laser again and look at Sci3, so here I have Sci3 in multiple channels. If I selected Sci3 in, let's say, this channel, which is similar to the one I selected in before, um, because there's another channel right next to it, here's all the channels now that Sci3 is impacting. If I selected one, a, a Psi3 product there, my other channels with Psi3 or similar fluorochromes would not be blocked out. And so I'd be able to select multiple floors that are highly overlapping in that way um, if I was using a spectral machine, spectral cytometer. So you basically have the entire range of the spectra across each laser to select as many floors in as you like. And we are, Floor Finder is working in other ways to support spectral cytometers as well. And I'll cover some more of that later. But I just want to, for now, go back to our main, the original panel that I was working on here. I'm going to select something for my CD8. Maybe I'll go down and do HC Psi 7. And again, this is just in keeping with the panel that Sean is going to be working on later. I should show why I have this up, too, that we have 46 products. And if I didn't want to use any of the filters back on the markers page that I was at, we do have this filter products button here. So if I wanted to filter down and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not, no offense to any of these companies. I'm just going to say, well, I'm not going to buy anything from this company or that company or whatever you want to do. You could say, you know, filter based on that. If I was doing just clinical work and I wanted to get rid of my research use only products, I could do that. 
and just filter it down to just my ASR products. So lots of different powerful things you can do with these filters here. I'm going to select something, let's say a product from Sysmax. And I think I've showed most of the main functionality here. There are a couple other things to go over. In addition to those pop-ups for helping you choose fluorochromes, we do have this Spectre Viewer button at the top. And I'm going to click that and it'll show, show Spectre Viewer here. And this is going to pull up this panel and the various Spectre that I've selected for this panel. And there we go. So, sorry, a little connection issue there. This is broken down per laser, so I have these little toggles on the left-hand side here for my different laser lines. And it's, they're dynamic, so to whatever extent each of these fluorochromes is excited off of each individual laser, I'm going to see that, and I can adjust accordingly. So a little bit messy because there's not a lot of space to work with here. So for those of you who want to see a cleaner Spectre Viewer, we just launched, uh, I'm going to pop out to another tab here for just a second. We just launched our standalone Spectre Viewer here. Um, and you can get to that off of our main site here under Tools, Spectre Viewer. And this is kind of nice because, again, you can enter your laser filters or you can pre-select a cytometer if we already have your cytometer in here. And what's nice about this is, I don't know if you, if you can see this, but I have a BUV dye here, an Alexafluor, an Addo dye, CF dye, an IR dye, a Liver, liver dye product from Biotium, a Superbright from Thermo, um, all the different vendors here. And I can see them all on one Spectre Viewer and within the context of my cytometer if I wanted to enter that or, or select one that I already had. So no need to go around to 10 different Spectre Viewers. We have about 650 fluorochromes in here, so one place you can see everything and make your selections that way. So once you've, uh, oh, there's a couple other buttons on here that I should talk about. In addition to the Spectre Viewer, I'm going to go ahead and hide that to get the space back. We have the Viability Dyes button. Um, which if I, by clicking on the Viability Dyes button, will add a whole separate column over here to the right-hand side, which you can see um, I've added. It adds a column that will show every Viability Dye in the Floor Finder system and show you which channel each one is optimal in. So it makes it really easy to select a Viability Dye as you go through the panel building process. If you're doing fluorescent protein work, you can use this fluorescent protein button and it'll add all the fluorescent proteins into this matrix. If you're doing custom conjugations, you can click this button, colors with no products available, and that way any fluorochrome, or let's say you have a marker that um, there's no commercially available products available for, but you conjugate that in your lab, you could use this to assign any color to any marker in your panel. It's kind of a nice touch. When you're done, you're going to want to continue to our panel summary page, which is the final page on Floor Finder, and you'll get this nice summary of all the different products you've selected. Again, you haven't purchased anything, this is really just for your own records. You can then print this summary. You can export this into PDF or a CSV or Excel file. Um, you can go in and save your work. And that's something that you're definitely going to want to do as you're using Floor Finder. You can enter a panel name uh, to your liking and then save that either within your personal save panels. Each user in Floor Finder has their own personal account. Or if you want to collaborate with other individuals, maybe your lab or you're collaborating with somebody at another university or something, you can create what we call a lab or a team and save the panel to that location. And then anybody within that group is then going to get a copy of this panel so they could work on it with you together. I think it's also probably worth showing that what the save panel page looks like when I get to it. So here we go. This is my save panel page. And the, here's a list of all the, the panels that I have saved in the past. And the reason I wanted to show this is because we try to support the, the design experiment and the, the, the life cycle of the experiment all the way through from design to finish. After you've run the experiment, you can come back in here and enter in your titrations, you know, maybe whatever that might be. You can enter in your lot numbers. These are all dynamic fields. You can add comments. So if I show comments, like here was the best panel ever. I don't know that that was. It's just a demonstration panel, but still, you get the idea. Um, something else that's nice about Floor Finder here is when I come back into this panel, I can see my Spectre Viewer. I can break that Spectre Viewer here. I have more, more space here, so I can break this into a multi-laser view. I can see exactly what the setup of that panel was. 
And also you might notice on this particular panel, I see this one product for my CD56 product that is now discontinued. Now, when I built this panel, that was not a discontinued product. So under normal circumstances, it might be a pain in the neck to go back through and find a replacement product. But because this is in FloraFinder, I could come here to modify panel and go to modify products. And by clicking that, it's going to bring me right back into the it's going to bring me right back into the um, markers page for that product. So I could then come into this page and deselect the one that's discontinued and very quickly find where I have space left on my cytometer to replace that product, either with the same fluorochrome or with another fluorochrome. So that's the main functionality of FluorFinder. I, there are a couple other nice things to talk about up here in the resources page. There's a lot of information in here with cytometer models or analysis software, or news, our old historic newsletters core manager resources, and in particular, I think I should mention the OMIPS page. This has been one of our um, most appreciated pages. We have this whole page here on, on OMIPS. So all the OMIPS that have been published, you can access them all directly from FloraFinder. So if you happen to be doing an in-depth characterization of human T regulatory cells or something similar to that, and you're doing that on um, this type of machine, you can come right in here and use this OMIP as a, as a basic starting point for your panel and then make adjustments and, and, and uh, selections off of that or based off of that or iterate it any way you want. If you want to link out directly to the OMIP papers, with one click you can find the exact cytometry part A panel and go from there. So Sean, I know I was rambling on quite a bit there without any live questions to be asked, but um, I will go back through at the end and we'll answer any questions that were there. But I think that covers the basic functionality of FloraFinder. And uh, I think that that should give people an idea of how to use our platform. And, and I think at this point, they'd want to jump over and jump over and uh, start seeing how the SES Express works. Great. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm going to flip the presentation over to me now, and um, we'll be able to see this. So uh, what, are we, what we're going to be covering in the next portion of the webinar is kind of picking up where you've left off uh, from your, your panels in FluoroFinder. And we're going to be talking about that in kind of two use cases of, of two data sets, one data set coming from a, a conventional cytometer and another coming from a data set from a spectral cytometer. Uh, so we're going to give you some information about kind of how to work with these uh, different type of panels in FCS Express. So um, to kind of get started with this, you know, data from panels built with FluoroFinder essentially can be analyzed very quickly and efficiently with FCS Express due to the way that we can handle kind of panels of data coming into the software. Um, essentially, these things can be created and saved and used over and over again, kind of like uh, as Jeff mentioned that in FluoroFinder you can uh, you know save those panel designs and share them with your teammates. Well, it's really great too. I mean, if you have some panel that you've shared with your teammates and then you've even gone through and created an analysis in FCS Express, well, you can share that with them as well. Um, so not only can they go back and purchase all the antibodies that they need to run the, the panel, whether it be conventional or spectral, and then they can pick that up and, and work in FCS Express as well. So again, what we try and do is you can use those for routine analysis analysis to really minimize the time it takes to get results. And another way that FCS Express facilitates minimizing that time to get any results is by directly exporting um, your results in FCS Express to tools like PowerPoint, to PDF, to Excel, as well as using what we call integrated spreadsheets within FCS Express. So imagine having the power of moving a gate and you're updating your results updating live in a software like Excel or your bar plots updating in real time. And that's really what we can achieve using FCS Express. And again, the really important thing too when we talk about spectral data analysis is that FCS Express can analyze data from a spectral instruments for both the raw spectral data, uh, kind of looking at uh, charts of the raw emission spectrums coming from them, and also looking at it uh, in terms of a conventional analysis. And one of the things that you're going to see is that when we work with spectral data uh, in FCS Express, it really is just kind of conventional analysis. It's something that you're used to that you've been doing for many years, except 
you're getting all the great benefits that come from you know working with these spectral cytometers, like you know working with the the SciTech Aurora, you get all the benefits of working with that. Uh, but you can also access the raw spectral data when you need. So to get started today, we're going to talk about um, working with some data in FCS Express and how we do that. And really where I like to start with this is starting at the end and starting kind of showing you what this can look like. Um, so what we have open right now on the screen is an FCS Express analysis template. Um, and what we're going to do is populate this with some data. Um, and to do so, it's very quick and easy. We have something called the data list up here. And one of the ways that you can pull data into FCS Express is simply by grabbing some data files and dragging and dropping them into the data list. So when we do that, what kind of happened here behind the scenes is that all of our analysis, all of our charts have automatically populated in FCS Express uh, with the data that we pulled into the data list. And one thing that you're going to see here is that a lot of the markers that Jeff, actually all of the markers that Jeff had uh, pulled up to look at in FloraFinder are here. This is the actual panel that was designed in FloraFinder being pulled into FCS Express. Now one of the really important points in FCS Express or one of the things to remember is that as we update a gate, as we make changes to our data, um, as we move things around in the software, all of our analysis is going to update in real time. And that means you know, not just gated populations, things like bar charts, things like our spreadsheets. So you notice as I move this lymphocytes gate, um, all of that information, again, is updating as we move that around. And it's a very powerful tool and something that other software uh, is not going to allow you to get to is being able to move our markers, our gates, our quadrants, and having things that are downstream results like bar plots updating immediately. The other thing is, is if we have many data files, which most people do, as you navigate around through your different data files using the data list, all of the information and in all of our charts updates immediately. And very importantly, when you're ready to get these results out to another format, if you need to go out to PDF, to PowerPoint, to Excel, um, we know that you know, what you have open in FCS Express is not the be-all, end-all. It's very close to the final report. But what we can do is set up what we call batch processing in FCS Express. And what we do here is we simply click Run. And when we click Run, FCS Express is going to do a few things. Here we have it exporting to PowerPoint, to PDF, and you can see we're already starting to generate our PDFs. And we're doing that for as many data files as we have in the data list. Um, there's no upper limit to what you can have in the data list. The most I've actually seen analyzed in the data list at one time is something around 20 or 30,000 data files. Most people's uh, experiments, hopefully you're not sitting there running 20, 30,000 tubes. It's more of a high content type of thing. But again, you can crunch through as much data as you need very quickly and easily. And at the end here, PowerPoint's going to launch up, Excel is going to launch up, and we have all the information for all of our subsets across all of our different gates, all of our different files, all of our different samples exported here in a statistics table. Um, we also have this exported to PowerPoint, and don't be confused, we're no longer in FCS Express, we are now in PowerPoint. We know it looks very similar, and I'll touch more on that. But very importantly, unlike other software than when they export to PowerPoint, FCS exports as high resolution what we call vector graphics. So each plot, each chart is its own item. You can move it around the page. Um, you know, we can move these to the front, to the back, so you can see them. And if this is all you need for your publication, for your poster, you now have that publication ready figure um, exactly how you want it in the format that you need um, and ready to report out. Um, additionally, in that batch, we've actually created a bunch of separate PDFs um, for all the samples. So if we need to go back and pull up one sample, we can do that very quickly and easily. So what I want to do now is show you how we build up some of this in FCS Express. Because if you remember what we did here, the workflow was simply drag and drop data files into our data list, adjust our gates as we need, click run on the batch process to generate results. Um, and that's really what we want to see you being able to do in the software. So to get started on that, um, what I'm going to do is open up what we call a new layout in FCS Express. So I'm going to click on New and New Blank Layout. Um, you're going to see this opening up. And the layout is where we're going to be able to perform any sort of data analysis we want in FCS Express. 
Um, so one of the places to get started here is we need to bring some data in. And what you need to do is think about FCS Express like Microsoft PowerPoint or Microsoft Office. In a Microsoft PowerPoint, if you wanted to insert a text box or a shape or a picture, you would do that through the Insert tab. And it works very much the same way in FCS Express. We can insert dot plots and density plots, you know, whatever type of plot you need for your data. But also in PowerPoint, if you wanted to insert an image of your data, uh, an image, you could drag and drop from a folder. And the same thing goes for FCS Express. If we want to drag and drop an FCS file, we can drag it and drop it, insert a density plot, and then we can start working with this data um, just like any other uh, object in PowerPoint, moving it, resizing it, uh, getting it into whatever format we need. That also includes if we need to kind of change or change around, you know, how this looks, if we want to change to a landscape kind of format, if we wanted to arrange, align items, um, all the kind of familiar Microsoft Office tools are here. But again, we're working with this panel, and I'm going to show you how to kind of set this up. So if I wanted to change to side scatter versus CD45, um, I can do so. I can then create a gate on this analysis uh, for our first population that we're looking at here. I'm going to be presented to create a gate and give it a name. And one thing you can remember in FCS Express is try dragging and dropping. If it makes kind of sense, intuitive sense to drag something and drop it, try it. So if I wanted to open up gate one on another plot and have that gate applied, well, you can drag the gate out, you can drop it, and the gate will be applied. And you'll notice that as I move the gate, um, everything is updating in real time for me. So in this plot, I want to change to CD3. Um, you'll notice that I'm actually just starting to type here. So as you start typing in FCS Express, um, you know, if you have a very long list of parameters, you can type to access them. And I'll create another gate here for CD3 positives. We'll pull this over so we can take a look. And another gate here for CD3 negatives. And we'll give this a name and pop it over. So you may be wondering now, where do we manage these gates, right? We've created some gates, we have them in uh, the software, but where do we view the hierarchies and how this information is uh, being retained? Well, we insert something that we call a gate view. And the gate view is an object. It will be printed. And you can see that this is where your gating hierarchy is coming in here. And the gate view is also a great way if you need to manage uh, your gate names, your gate colors. I can actually double click on this. And if I want to change it from you know, gate 1 to lymphs, I can do that. And it's going to update wherever that gate name is. So if I have the lymphocytes gate displayed on multiple charts, I don't need to go back and change it over and over again. Now, additionally, we're going to look at some subsets for this data. So we're going to take our CD3 positive population and put it over here. We're going to take our CD3 negative population and put it over here. And we're going to start changing over here to look at our CD4 versus CD8. Again, kind of showing you how to build up this analysis as we showed it to you in the beginning. And we'll show CD16. And the additional things that we want to create in here are some quadrant gates. Um, so I'm going to put a quadrant on this plot by clicking on the gating tab quadrants, and I'll put a quadrant on this plot as well. Now, one thing you may want to do in FCS Express is if you want to kind of use your quadrants as actual gates, um, you'd right click on the plot, and we would say convert the quadrants to gate. So if I want to use quadrants for my CD4s, I'd choose convert and link, and I'm just going to call this CD4 positive. And you're going to see it's going to put it in the correct place in the hierarchy. Um, so whenever we're doing this, if we do a lower right convert and link, and this is going to be our CD8 positive, um, because you have a gate applied, FCS Express knows where to put this in the hierarchy. So if we came down here, and again, we wanted to do something like converting the upper left to our CD19s and doing something like the lower right and making this our NK cells. Um, you can see it's very quick and easy to kind of build this up and have the hierarchy apply correctly. Now, additionally, we, we have some data in here. We have some plots, but you may want to format these to achieve whatever kind of publication needs that you have. Um, so one thing is you may not want to use density plots all the time. And in some cases, it's not the best type of plot to use. Um, well, in the Format tab, you can change to whatever plot you want. If you want to use a color dot plot, if you want to use something like a contour plot, you can pick and choose. You don't have to make that kind of choice um, right up front as you click on it.
And additionally, if you double click on a plot or if you multiple select plots, um, you can format information about these by choosing the format tab. Um, now one really kind of quick thing that I see a lot of people liking to do is if you want to, instead of just showing the file name and the type and the title of the plot, if you want to put something like the current gate, you can type that in and you can see that with our new live formatting interface here, as you make a change like putting the current gate in, it's going to put that in the title of the plot and it's going to do it immediately. So when you have a formatting window open, this little dialog, you can actually click on and change anything about this plot. So if I wanted to come in and you know start looking at the axes and maybe I want to fool around with my bi-exponential scaling to see how this changes on the plot, Right? We can actually move this little slider bar around that we just added in version 7. Um, and again, as you click on a plot, the formatting options associated with that plot are going to change and update as you use these tools. So again, building this up is, is pretty simple. Um, we're almost to the point where we have a final report uh, from this very simple subset. But we do want to get some statistics. So we can do this by inserting what we call a spreadsheet. Um, now the spreadsheets look and feel and work just like Microsoft Excel except that they're in here and they're linked to your data and that's one of the really cool things. So in Excel, if I wanted to put in um, some header rows for this, I'd probably type something in. But with these spreadsheets in FCS Express, if I have some information like maybe the gate name displayed somewhere, I can drag it and drop it directly into the spreadsheet. If I you know, want to type things in, of course, I can do that as well. Um, so I'll get a few statistics in here. But the other thing is, if I want to get statistics into this spreadsheet, if I see them, I can drag it and drop it. Even if I don't see it, you can grab an entire plot and drag it and drop it in there and choose whatever statistic you need. But you can see you can fill these spreadsheets out very quickly. And the most important thing about this is as I move a gate, you're going to notice that these spreadsheets are updating immediately and in real time um, as I move that gate. And that also means if I need to do things like uh, you know, CD4 to CD8 ratio, we can use this just like Excel. In Excel, you would probably put in an equal sign, you'd grab one cell, you'd divide it by another, you press enter, then you have a CD4, CD8 ratio, but with FCS Express, you have the added capability here of being able to see those changes update in real time as you move it around. Now, additionally, we have other plot types in the software that are going to help you get to your final result. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the spreadsheet, and I'm going to say insert a bar plot. And there's other plot types you can choose, pie charts, box and whiskers, scatter with regression. Um, but when I do this, you can see that I insert a chart. Um, I've got my bar plot for my different uh, statistics that are here. And again, as I move my gates around the bar plots, uh, everything in there is going to update for me as well. So again, this is a final result, getting a spreadsheet, getting a bar chart, getting some information from all of your data, um, that is a final result, and that's what we're trying to get you to in FCS Express. And there's a lot more about these spreadsheets that I didn't cover today. We have separate webinars and, of course, lots of information. Um, you know, if you wanted to use things like statistical information, doing ANOVAs, doing t-tests, um, we have most of the functionality that Excel has. Um, if you need to use things like conditional formatting to put in data bars or color scaling or sorting, uh, we really do have just about all of the functionality that Excel has and accessible with just a few clicks within the software. So again, what we're trying to do here is build up um, a basic analysis. And once you have this, you can save it and you can use it over and over and over again. So if you're running the same data, even if some things about your panel change, you can use this as a starting point. But to kind of recap and bring it back around to what we're doing here is, you know, you can take what I built up you know, very quickly in just about five or ten minutes there, format it to whatever format you want, and, and arrive at a kind of plot um, and analysis template that you can use over and over. So if you send this to your colleagues because they're running the same panel, essentially they can open up FCS Express, they can come to this data list and say add a data file, they can drag and drop into it, and again what will happen as soon as they load data into here, it's going to populate the plots, um, they'll be able to move their gates and be able to start deriving um, all the information they need very, very quickly and very easily using tools that are just like Microsoft Office and Excel. 
But again, what we've done here today is looking at, we've started to take a look at some conventional, say, flow cytometry data. Um, if we look at the header for this data file, you're going to see that it was acquired on a BD fax canto. Um, so this is kind of a conventional cytometer. Now, FCS Express also has the ability to work with data from any spectral cytometer. Um, and what I'd like to show you is some of the tools that we have in the software that are kind of special for working with spectral data. And the spectral data set we're going to be working with today, um, if we look at the header for this data file, you can see that it's from a, a SciTech Aurora, right? Um, and we've pulled this data into the software. And I think one of the most important things, and one of the things you're probably looking at right now and thinking about is, wow, this just looks like regular flow cytometry data, right? Well, it is, right? And one of the really nice things about working with tools like the, you know, the ones from, uh, or instruments like the SciTech Aurora, is that the data is still going to look like you've always, you know, known it, um, in you know, working with classical flow cytometry data, uh, but it does have a spectral component to it um, that allows you a lot of additional capability for working with dyes and dye combinations that you may not have been able to do in the past, as well as opening up the number of markers you can work with at the same time, right? So there's a lot more markers that we've pulled in from the SciTech Aurora system um, than we did from our, our kind of standard uh, Canto instrument. So really, you know, when you're working with spectral data, there really isn't that much special you have to do for working with this in FCS Express. You can create your basic plots and charts, you know, just like we did working with a conventional cytometer. You can do this across, you know, many pages. So if you're working with, you know, tools, spectral tools or spectral instruments, you probably will need more pages because you have more markers, and that's fine. FCS Express handles that without an issue, and you can build up, you know, different pages for all of your subsets, for all of your main gating, all the populations you need to look at. But there is one very special chart in here, and this is what we call a spectral plot or a spectrum plot. And in the spectrum plot, um, we're actually plotting the raw spectral values that are coming from the, in this case, the SciTech Aurora system, and we're linking them up directly to the gated data. So as we move this gate for the lymphocytes, you're going to see that in my spectrum chart here for my CD3 positives and negatives, um, that that spectral information is updating immediately and in real time. And in this case, we actually have an overlay here. We're overlaying the CD3 negative population in red with the CD3 positive population in green to kind of evaluate and look at, you know, what's going on with those two populations. One of the other nice things, you know, I do have the gate applied here, but we can go back the other way. If we wanted to say, you know, look at this subset, um, you know, from this spectral kind of line or these detectors here and apply it to one of our regular charts, we can see and we can confirm what this actually is part of here. So, and again, as we move this around on the spectral plot, um, you'll be able to kind of see um, you know, what's going on with those populations. So again, most of what you're going to be doing in FCS Express is the same, but what I do want to cover in the next five or ten minutes is how to specifically work with these spectral plots, because this is something new. And if you never want to work with a spectrum plot in FCS Express, that's absolutely fine. It's not mandatory. You can analyze this just like conventional flow cytometry data, but again, you're getting all the benefits of working with instruments like the SciTech Aurora, um, which will allow you to work with kind of new combinations and work with more markers and work with a lot of um, kind of ease of use that you might not have with your other instruments. So when we get started working with any spectral data in FCS Express, um, again, building any sort of templates or panels for analysis, uh, we do it the same way as we did before. We open up a, a new layout. FCS Express is going to open a, a blank page that looks like PowerPoint, and you're going to be prompted, uh, or you're going to want to insert some data. Now, one of the special things is when we work with spectral data in FCS Express, um, or when you work with spectral data really anywhere, uh, the spectral data files will come out in their unmixed form, and they'll generally have another data file within the same folder, or depending on how, uh, you know, what software version of the instrument acquisition you're using. Uh, if you're working with SciTech instruments, you might have a folder for unmixed and for raw, um, but there'll be two components. And the unmixed version is essentially the standard FCS file. Um, the file that doesn't have any sort of uh, you know, suffix associated with it is actually the raw spectral data. 
So all we need in SCS Express is if you have these two files in the same folder, we'll link them up, and that way you can work with spectrum plots. Um, if you don't want to work with spectrum plots, you don't have to have both of these files there. As long as you have the unmixed, you can work with that just like regular conventional old spectral data. Uh, uh, flow cytometry data. But it works the same way. If I drag and drop this unmixed data file into FCS Express, um, FCS Express is going to prompt me for what type of plot I want to insert. I'm going to choose a density plot and what I'll be able to do, and let me move this over to my other screen here, I'll get that out of the way, is I can work with this just like standard flow cytometry data. And if I wanted to change to side scatter versus forward scatter, if I want to create some gates on this, I can do so very quickly and easily. Um, I won't give these any sort of specific names here because it doesn't really matter for this context. But again, if I want to drag it out, open up something like um, the CD3 channel and create some additional gates on here. Again, I can do this all very quickly and easily, you know, just through dragging and dropping, uh, selecting some of these tools from the toolbar, and creating the plots and gates that I need. But importantly, in the Insert tab, there's another type of plot you can access. It's called a Spectrum Plot. And if we insert a Spectrum Plot into FCS Express, we're going to be able to access all of the channels and the full range of spectral data associated with this data set. Um, in this case, again, it came from Spectral Flow software from the SciTech Aurora. Now, these spectrum plots have special formatting properties. Um, so we display them to you in some sort of default way. But if we double click on the plot to format it, you can see that there's some specific options. And one of the options that folks are going to be interested in changing is probably the interpolate values. So if we check this, it essentially means we're going to smooth the data. We're going to smooth the, um, the kind of raw spectral plot that was there. We're going to connect some of the points so we can start making a little bit more sense of what's going on. And if you'd like to, you can increase the values, you can increase the interpolation points, you can create some additional smoothing. If you uh, kind of need to up the resolution of this, you can up the resolution of it as well to kind of further increase smoothing and the sharpness on the plot. And you may wonder, you know, why don't we just put in a resolution of 1,000 and 100 interpolation points by default? Um, because the more smoothing that we do to this chart, uh, the more computationally intensive it is, right? So it's one thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, if you go in here and you try and set your interpolation points to 100, uh, your computer is going to have to think really hard about how to smooth that data, and it may take some time to update the plot. Um, and in fact, if you put in an interpolation value of 100, it may not be any better than an interpolation point of 8, so to say, the way that that data looks. Um, so you're really kind of trading off speed for uh, aesthetics, uh, but again, in most cases, using some of the default values we, hear, we have here will help you get to what you need very quickly and easily. Now, another way that we can display the data is not just on a density plot. Um, we can say backgate it, give us color on gated overlays. And when we do so, that plot is going to show um, the raw spectral lines from all of our data, from all of our gates, um, by default, um, as the color of the gates. So the kind of blue here is our monocytes. There's some red in the background from the lymphocytes. But if you'd like, just like backgating any plot, you can come into the color levels. Um, I'm sorry, you can come into the gates to display. You can say, well, let's only show backgating for something like the CD3 positives um, and the lymphocytes. And when we do that, we'll be able to see the backgating information um, just for those two populations. But again, there's a lot of kind of uh, information here. There's a lot of spectral lines. There's a spectral line for every single event in this data file. Um, but if you choose shade based on density, essentially what FCS Express is going to do for you is give you uh, a density line of, you know, the most dense populations or the, the, the area of, um, you know, most frequently where cells are appearing here. And again, very importantly is if I apply a gate, like say my CD3 positive to the chart, we'll be able to kind of get that information um, for our spectral lines very quickly and easily. Now, another way that people like to represent the spectral data um, in charts in FCS Express is by not just using every spectral line that's in here for every cell. It can be a little overwhelming, um, but what you can do is in the overlays section, if you don't want to view every spectrum, we can say, let's view the average. And essentially, we'll put in a line of the average, and as you move your gate around, um, you'll be able to see how that changes. 
Now, what a lot of people uh, tend to do, uh, what we see in FCS Express, is they like to kind of compare uh, different spectral charts to each other. So if I wanted to duplicate this plot and put it over here to the side, um, what I might want to do, well, let's look at the CD3 negatives at this spectral plot on the left. So we'll apply the gate over here, and then we'll apply the gate for our CD3 positives by dragging and dropping it onto the plot over here, and we can view these things side by side. So we can view this information for all of the spectral channels very quickly and easily. And the last kind of thing that uh, a lot of folks like to do is overlay these. So you know, that's what we had done in the original layout um, that we showed you here, and to overlay kind of gated populations Again, drag and drop. We can drag and drop one plot onto another, add it as an overlay. And what will happen with this plot is by um, kind of default here, it's going to show you all spectrums for the overlay. We're going to change it to an average, and we're going to change the gate on the overlay to show CD3 positive. And what we're now getting in this plot on the left is the red line is the CD3 positives overlined, overlaid over the spectrum of the CD3 negatives. Now, we don't just have to create overlays from gated populations. Um, if we have you know, additional data files in our data list, like we do here, um, you can actually drag a whole data file onto this plot, and you could say add it as an overlay. And what we'll do in these overlays is we'll just kind of look at um, some of the other channels that are here. We'll get rid of our gated overlay, and we'll change this to the average. And what we're seeing now is the uh, one sample is overlaid in blue, one sample is overlaid in black. And as we change to any of the different kind of lasers or the combinations of laser lines, um, we're going to be able to see uh, you know, how these uh, spectrums differ between all of our different data files and our data sets very quickly and easily. But again, what I want to focus, what I wanted to focus on here was essentially how to use the spectral plots. Because when it comes down to it, the spectral plots can, you know, they can be a large component to your analysis, or they could be a small component, or they might not be a component at all. Um, it's up to you if you'd like to use them. In the end, once you've created your panel, um, you can load it into FCS Express, you know, you can add additional data files to the data list, um, just like we did before. And if you have, um, you know, it doesn't matter what types of data files you have, we can pull in um, a few different ones here if we want. And we can use all of those tools, the batch processing, um, you know, adjusting the gates, getting bar plots, getting things like spreadsheets, updating immediately and in real time as I change between data files. So with that, that kind of covers, you know, how we use uh, the tools in FCS Express for spectral data analysis and how we use them for conventional data analysis. And really, in the end, there aren't, you know, too many differences associated um, with using conventional versus spectral data, except that with your spectral data sets, you can work with the spectrum plots. Um, it gives you the additional piece of information you need, and you have access to all of the nice multi-parametric tools that we have in here for handling big spectral data sets. So to kind of summarize what we've seen in FCS Express, again, the data from panels built with FluoroFinder can be quickly analyzed um, and analyzed efficiently in FCS Express. Uh, templates created for a specific panel in FCS Express can be used over and over again for routine analysis to minimize that time to results. Um, and what the results are, results are things like an export to PowerPoint, an image for your publication, uh, you know, a spreadsheet that analyzes all of your data. Those are things that we built in. And very importantly, FCS Express can analyze the data from any instrument, whether it be a conventional instrument, whether it be a, a new spectral instrument. But if you're working with the spectral instruments, we can view the raw spectral data to do whatever sort of downstream analysis you need. Uh, we can do that with the you know, conventional analysis as needed. But I think a really important point of intersection is again where FluoroFinder and FCS Express come together. Where again, as Jeff mentioned, you know, all of all these kind of panels that you build in FluoroFinder, they can be saved, they can be sent to your colleagues. Um, the same thing goes with FCS Express. If you've created a panel in FluoroFinder and you've saved it and you've sent it to your colleague, well, they can generate, you know, the same type of experiment from that panel. And if they've already created an analysis template in FCS Express, well, they could send them that too. And they can pick up in the data analysis kind of where they left off. 
So with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you for joining the webinar today. I hope everybody took a, a little bit away from the webinar today, uh, learning about how to use some of the tools in Flora Finder, um, how, in, how would you use some of the tools in FCS Express, and learning about how they kind of come together in certain ways to help kind of maximize efficiency for uh, you know, performing data analysis and uh, performing antibody selection and panel selection. So if you have any follow-up questions uh, about this webinar, we are going to answer some questions live here. Um, but if you have any follow-up questions, you can contact Jeff Jensen directly. Uh, you can contact support at floorfinder.com. If you have any questions for um, the team at DeNovo Software about FCS Express, you can contact us at support at denovosoftware.com. But with that, I'd like to say a, a big thank you uh, to, to Jeff and the entire team at FloraFinder for helping to make this a, a really successful webinar uh, and learning a little bit more about that. So Jeff, thank you for, uh, for joining us today on this as well. My pleasure to be here. Uh, did you want to answer any questions that have come in now, or just gonna we'll do that afterwards? Yeah. So we're gonna um, stop the webinar uh, recording here for a moment, and we're going to uh, get into answering some questions here. So thanks again for joining us today.